Hello and good morning. How are you doing? What's up? Uh, coolest person named in radio, Arrow <laughs> Collins. Are you serious? Is that your real given name? I A- love it. Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, well, you are you are quite the marketer, and I approve. <laughs> hey, dude, we've got something in common. The Carolinas. I'm right here in Charlotte. You, you, you your show is is based in in Carolina. Yeah, we we do. We spent some time down there in uh, North Carolina on the Outer Banks um, and the Shoals and the uh, the graveyard of the Atlantic, as it's called, because so many ships went down there, uh, as well as in the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, which <laughs> Don't you love everything you need to know? Except it doesn't. There's a lot more to it. Than that. And you know the swamps here in the South. What I love about them is that fa- they, they, they look dark and dingy and scary, but it's it's crystal clear water. Yeah, there, there's um, a beautiful lake in uh, in the Dismal Swamp we went to, and it looks black yeah. from the surface. But as you get closer, you can see right through to the bottom. You're absolutely right. That's See, and that's the beauty of your show, uh, American Outdoors, is that you're, you're taking people to places that they probably wouldn't look at if, if they didn't have an invitation. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. One, because maybe people are afraid of snakes and stuff, so that, that might be one good reason not to. But the other is because no one ever showed us. Um, what's just beneath that surface. And so I got the benefit of spending time with people all over the country who are really intimately connected to the outdoors right around them. And I got to see it from their perspective, which is of very much a a local, deeply knowledgeable perspective, including a lot of indigenous nations uh, within our nation who've been here since forever. That's so cool that you said that because there, there's an area not too far from me here. Um, it, it's now finally a national landmark, but the, the boulders are the sizes of houses, and, and indigenous people live there in the 1400s, but people don't understand that was once their lifestyle. Respect it. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, you know, I had some complicated discoveries making this show, Arrow. Like, I grew up in D.C. myself. I'm an East Coaster at heart. And uh, I spent a lot of time in state parks and national parks. And I thought of national parks as like, this is ours. This is our stuff. Mm-hmm. And then as we made this show, I visited with a, a number of indigenous groups. And they're like, this is ours. This is our stuff. And the only reason it's a national park is because the U.S. government has violated just about every treaty yep, yep. that it's ever signed with these indigenous groups. So the Death Valley National Park, uh, which the people there prefer to call Timbisha, uh, because Death Valley is the name that just a really dehydrated white man gave it when he had a hard time crossing one time. And so they're like, they're like, we know how to handle this. I'm sorry you had a difficult uh, experience with it. So the naming, the experience, and the access to some of these spaces isn't always as simple uh, as those of us uh, are taught it is once we get beneath that surface and talk to folks who've been here for a while. Are you keeping a journal on, on each one of these journeys? And the reason why I bring that up is because I am a daily writer, and I, I believe that yeah. journals speak to the next generation. It's not for us. We're, we're giving the, these lessons that we're going through to to the next ones. Arrow, I, I, um, I'm a child of the 1970s. However, in Internet years, I'm a child of, uh, of the cloud, and so I kept yep. a digital journal, yep. and I made selfies for myself. Um, I took a lot of photos. I let uh, Google Maps uh, track me my whole journey. So I have the the route that I traveled, almost like those old AAA triptych maps that I grew up with as a kid. I have the digital <laughs> version of those. So for, for every location that we uh, filmed in, we spent about a week. And I've got, you know, day one, I've got the, the photo of my, uh, my ticket sub for the flights. You know, I've got the food I was eating. Uh, I've got the road signs and, and wildlife and, uh, and some straight-to-video complaints every now and then. Uh, so I have a great record of this because I didn't want to forget it. We filmed during the summer of 2021. It was supposed to be a hot vac summer. Not quite, uh, but it was my first time getting on a plane since COVID and, uh, and, and leaving my zip code, actually, first time <laughs> leaving my state. For, so very, very special uh, trip just as a personal journey, much less to – to tell these stories with all these other great people. One of the things that I can connect with are the beekeepers. And the reason why is because not even a mile yeah. from this house, we have a gentleman that, that takes great pride in saying, the flowers in your yard, the, the apples on your trees are because of my bees. Beekeepers are very, very personal to Mother Earth. Yo, you are speaking the truth. You uh, you need to come out with me next time we do a shoot in your area. I'd love to see the world through your eyes. We spent time with uh, some of the least expected beekeepers from a... Uh, um, a storytelling perspective, Appalachian Beekeeper. Yes. Uh, this is the Appalachian Beekeeper Collective, and uh, it was designed to help folks 
uh, who are exiting the coal economy, which is the whole region, uh, despite a lot of headlines, like coal is just less popular now than a lot of other energy sources. So that means less jobs. Uh, but it meant for the people of, of this region, not just income, but also a different relationship with nature. Mm-hmm. And so you've got folks who used to make money from kind of rooting into nature and, and extracting from nature and sometimes blowing nature up to actually having to have a conversation with nature and being very in tune with these bees and their moods. And uh, I, I still have some honey that I got from Appalachia. It's the best honey I've ever had. And, and I got it right from this woman's backyard wow. and the flavor, because those mountains, the other thing I learned, the Appalachian mountains, you know, we think of them as like tiny because the Rockies are the great mountain ranges of the Americas. Of Sierra. It's just because they're old. You know, they're actually the greatest mountain range in the country because they've been here so damn long. <laughs> and all that residue, you know, it gets into the food, dude. It's why, it's why the hogs taste so good up there. It's why the, the food is so good. It's why the flowers are so beautiful and why the honey's so damn sweet. So, yeah, I'm really uh, – I want people to check out these beekeepers uh, that I got to spend time with. You Also, you can't freak out around bees. They're kind of like horses. Like animals just know us better than we know ourselves sometimes. And if you're agitated, the bees get agitated. And so it, it's a fast track to, uh, to mindfulness to just spend some time with bees because they will chill you out by necessity. That is so true. I'm glad you brought up mindfulness because I take a transition walk every day. And that, that to me is transitioning between the moods and the mindsets and being with nature becomes the teacher and I have to become the listener. And so that's, I think that's my connection with, with your show is, is the fact that you are not afraid to share the stories of other believers in, in their process. Yo, you call them believers. That's really, that's really good. Um, There is a, a, not fully religious, but there's a reverence mm-hmm. that I found amongst a lot of folks here for the power of nature. And, uh, and for some people who, uh, Jennifer Farr Davis, I hiked a bit of the Appalachian trail with her. And I was, I remember saying to her, this takes forever. Like you're going to pause your whole life for six months to do this hike. And she goes, or start your life. And I was like, what? That's absolutely right. You know, and and they have this saying on the trail, I'm going to paraphrase, it's something like the trail provides, or the trail gives you what you need. And sometimes you need chills. And sometimes you need a stranger to share a meal with. And sometimes you need to see a hawk, you know, off on the horizon. And sometimes you need a nap in the nook of this great tree. And so it's, there are many people in this series, uh, literally coast to coast and in between, who have maintained or rediscovered the connection with the outdoors that a lot of us have replaced uh, or fled from because of convenience, because we don't have the time or we don't think we have the money, uh, or because we spend too much time in the artificial world, uh, especially of, of screens and whatnot. So reverence for nature and, and reforging that connection, uh, it is this was a much more spiritual show than I expected it to be. <laughs> I'm not surprised, though, dude, because, I mean, you're being used. I mean, that's the greatest thing about this show is that you, you are giving yourself permission so that we can all live vicariously through you and so we can explore. Yes, yes. And sometimes, uh, as on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, nature has its way with you. <laughs> and uh, one of the, the, the most harrowing moments in the whole series, I'm, I'm out uh, on the Wright Brothers you know, sand dune, yeah. just reliving history. And I'm one, I think I was the 247th person to fly this replica of their 1911 glider. Wow. This is the one that proved flight was possible according to their theories. And there was a beautiful, windy day. And I watched the instructor uh, and I went up right after him. And I got to be honest, man, I actually, I flew better than the instructor on oh, my first man. go. Man. And Arrow, I was I was feeling myself. I can't I don't know any other way to say it. I was just like, I'm I'm a right brother now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like I'm definitely a brother. And I know I'm right. So I'm a right brother. Let's do it again. And they're like, yeah, do it again. Do it again. Let's capture it with some different cameras. We'll cut it together. It'll be really smooth. Like <clears throat> pardon me. And uh the second flight Yo, I almost destroyed myself. No, no. The winds were so choppy. I forgot everything that I was taught in terms of not overdoing it on the controls. I flew straight up into the air and then overcompensated by flying straight down no. and pulled up just in time to land uh, with a hard but manageable thud 
on the sand. And then I really understood why the Wright brothers chose to fly on sand. It, it was uh, not just the prettiness. It was very <laughs> functional. Please come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and uh, to you and anyone listening, July 5th, 9 p.m., America Outdoors with Baritone Day Thurston. Uh, let's rediscover our connection with each other through the outdoors. You bet. Be brilliant today.